Hello and welcome everybody to another digital summit happening on a very, very busy day. We're all, some of us are here in Washington, D.C. at the GLF investment case. Uh, during the investment case, we're talking about lots of different forms of increasing funding and investments into sustainable landscapes. And we could not have this discussion without talking about conservation. And more importantly, talking about the role of private capital in conservation. And that's why we have a group of esteemed speakers here to expand and talk about this. Um, as always, throughout the digital summit, please ask questions in the question bar on the side of the screen. You can see it over there. I'm David Thomas, and I'm with the Global Landscapes Forum. What I'm going to ask our lovely presenters to do is one by one, just in 30 seconds, introduce yourself and tell everybody who you are. So why don't we start with you, Marco? Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Marco Cerezo. Uh, I'm the National Director for Fundaeco, a Guatemalan conservation NGO that has partnered with the Alfelia Climate Fund and Ecosphere Plus on a Red Plus project for Caribbean Guatemala. We have been working together for over three years now, and we're very excited at, for, to share our experiences. Marco really bringing us a real project example of some of the broader themes that we're going to be talking about today. How about Kate? You introduce yourself. Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Kate Dillon Levin. I'm Vice President of Marketing and Sales for Ecosphere Plus. Ecosphere Plus is the marketing and sales arm of the Althelia Climate Fund. Uh, we're very focused on growing financing for sustainable landscapes, regenerative landscapes from the point of view of demand for ecosystem services. So we work to build partnerships with businesses and individuals really to help um, mainstream uh, conservation as well as sustainable production throughout our economy. Superb, so spreading the word. Um, Christian, how about you introduce yourself for us? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Althea is an impact investment business. Uh, we were set up in uh, 2011 to focus on uh, what uh, was then called sustainable land use. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's pretty obvious to us uh, what we are in the impact investment business focused on uh, integrated land management. Um, we um, um, also talk a lot about natural capital. In 2013, uh, we launched the Althea Climate Fund, which um, at the time, and I've as some might say still is, uh, quite unique. That fund is focused on the nexus between uh, sustainable production on one hand and protection and conservation of these large pieces of areas uh, on the other, uh, using a combined strategy of uh, uh, sustainable productive activities on the one hand and improving productivity, yields, reducing intermediation, and quality, leaving small producers generally in with. Um, um, but also generating new income streams uh, from uh, revenue sources such as carbon and energy services. Uh, so that's what we're doing with our first fund uh, and launching uh, successor funds this year, and uh, which we should be very excited about this place. Very much, Christian. Okay, and last but by absolute no means least, Augustine, could you please give us a 30 second introduction into you and who you are? Sure, and I'm glad you said not least. Uh, so, I, um, I'm Augustine Silvani, I'm Vice President of Conservation Finance at Conservation International, which is a large environmental NGO operating in over 30 countries. Um, the group that I manage with NCI is uh, really focused on mobilizing both public and private funding for conservation through the different mechanisms and partnerships. Uh, we've done that uh, over the last 15 years, $300 million have been deployed through various mechanisms. So happy to be here and, and uh, share some of that. Back. Excellent. Thank you, Augustine. And with that background, I wonder if you could kick us off and give us a little bit of a background of why we're here, why we're talking about this. Why, why is this important for us to be having a conversation about the role of private capital in conservation? Sure. Happy, happy to do that. And, um, I think it's a broad question and a broad topic, but it's one that, that obviously uh, as an NGO is, is very um, very close to us, something we think about quite a bit, uh, and we see the, the market sort of evolve. 
but uh, you can sort of divide it into two parts, right? Why conservation? And that, that's simply answered by our, our sort of tagline, people need nature to thrive. Uh, I won't go into the issues because uh, everybody here understands them, climate change and why we need nature and forests. Uh, but it's, it's really about the capital. How, how are we going to preserve these, uh, these places? How are we going to fund these sustainable production systems? And we know that there's a huge gap right now. Uh, there's about, um, you know, recent science says that nature in general is about 30% of the climate solution. Right now, it's only receiving about 2% of the climate funding. So only just looking at it from a climate lens, the huge disparity between the, the solution that nature can provide, uh, conservation, whatever you want to call it, natural capital, versus uh, how much is being invested in it, and how much is thoroughly um, Private sector represents a very small part of that. So from a conservation sort of point of view, we, you know, we realize that private sector finance is needed not only to scale up the finance, uh, which obviously represents billions and billions of capital, but also and also as important, I think, is what the private sector brings. So new ideas, efficiency, um, just different ways of doing things, which, which are, are, are needed in our space. We need innovation, we need everything that the private sector sort of brings. Uh, and I think we need to in the way we've traditionally done conservation. So it's, it's a huge gap right now. We talk about it a lot. It's sort of incremental change, and uh, and we need more action to really scale it up to the point where it becomes you know, mainstream. Fascinating. So lots of, yeah, I mean, I think it's probably true for all of us that the idea of why nature is, is something that we all basically understand. And I'm sure everyone listening to this uh, Digital Summit will understand that as well. But I, th I think it's interesting, this interaction of private sector efficiencies and the role of capital in, in that. So Christian, maybe, maybe you can help us think about this idea a little bit more. And the idea of natural capital or nat natural resources as an asset class, um, maybe of themselves. And is that something that's viable? Is that something that would be interesting for an investor to, to look at? Um, yeah, that's a good question, and uh, it's, it's something we've thought a lot about um, recently and, of course, when we were setting up the fund. Um, I'll confess that I, myself, have been heard and seen referring to natural capital or, or what Alphelia does as kind of a new asset class, and it's really tempting to do that because I think the way that we're investing um, is certainly is novel and innovative, and there are a lot of features that maybe haven't been seen before. Um, nevertheless, I... I I and some others that I've been conversing with um, 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 most recently in, in the GLF group in London kind of have come to the conclusion that um, referring or, or building natural capital as a new asset class, however tempting it is, is maybe a, uh, a red herring or perhaps even a cold stack. And why am I saying that? Um, let's be honest. I mean, if we think about natural capital as the Earth's natural resources, you know, forests, other natural habitat, minerals, uh, it's a uh, biodiversity itself, it's, it's the oldest asset class in human civilization and societies since you know, the time immemorial have been converting that natural capital into financial capital. Indeed, it's sort of as what you know, um, happened from classical times right up to the present. Um, the problem is, of course, we all know this, that um, in very recent times, since the middle of the last century, human populations and rates of consumption have increased dramatically. So what was possible for the Romans to do, or even you know, um, um, medieval societies to do, in terms of harnessing the, the, the wealth and nature, um, at the same clip becomes unsustainable very quickly when we have 8 billion people running around the face of the planet. So my point is this. Um, we've been investing uh, in the conversion of nature to uh, indu for industrial purposes and consumption for a very long time, but we've not done so with a lens or the filter of sustainability. All we, our, our view is that what we need to do is, is to bring reality, but you can use the term sustainability if you want, but let's, let's call it reality, to uh, the oldest of asset classes and start utilizing the bounty of nature in such a way that nature can provide that bounty for us, for the remainder of the time we have here, but also for future generations, and importantly for other species uh, with whom we share this planet. So no, it's not a new asset class, it's an old one that is in need of a refurbishment. Okay, so interesting. So it's an old asset class, and it's one that we have used before. But currently, it's an asset class that 
maybe is only associated with philanthropic giving and those sorts of things. So K. I, I don't mean to interrupt. That. Sorry. Go on, no, no, interrupt. Trillions of dollars that is um, trillions of dollars that is invested annually in um, agro produce, uh, commodities, etc. That's driving conversion and deforestation. So we can talk about timber. We can talk about monoculture, agriculture, all the rest. To right. me, the way I'm looking at this. That's natural capital. I mean, it is converting nature to something that is for human consumption. And we need to start operating those businesses with um, through, through, the, through the lens of reality. So it's not just about the, um, the conservation side. Conservation needs to be an outcome of mainstream agriculture. Mm -hmm. We need to really, really get there. And that's a long journey, but we have to start somewhere. And, and I think we have. Um, we, we need to empower those, in, those fast starts. Okay, so uh, okay, I'm going to change things around a bit. Uh, Marco, how do we do that then? Well, I think that there is mounting evidence that uh, conservation goes hand in hand with sustainable productive landscapes. I would like to mention, for instance, the concept of birdscapes that has been developed by American Bird Conservancy. After many, many years of studying birds, we have realized that in order to protect all species of birds, particularly migrants here in the neotropics, we must not only protect natural forests, but we also need to establish a diversified mosaic of, of landscape uses, such as, as agroforestry, timber extraction, plantations, riparian habitats. So science is demonstrating that we can have both things at the same time, biodiversity conservation and landscapes that are productive, that are generating revenue and that are regenerating employment for local populations. And it's a win-win situation because we are establishing productive systems, sustainable productive systems that are good for biodiversity, but also helping communities generate revenues, which in turn is absolutely necessary in, er in order to save the remaining natural forests. So I think science is on our side. And the trick is how can we build projects that put value into conservation for instance, through carbon, but also put value to sustainable land uses that are producing uh, commodities that are also good for biodiversity. So, Kate, is that an argument we're winning? That it, uh, if it's that easy that, okay, biodiversity means productive landscapes, then surely this should be a really simple argument to win. Are we yeah. winning that argument? Uh, I would say currently we're not winning that argument, but there are some really exciting signs. Um, kind of to sort of go back to the question that you asked of Christian, I think there is tremendous demand for this. This is coming from companies that are invested heavily in natural resources where their future revenue streams are dependent on that. And they realize that climate you know, presents a very real risk and they need solutions. And, but the challenge is that currently our natural capital is valued more destroyed than it is living and integrating. And that's what's so remarkable about the Althelia Climate Fund model is it's really looking at how do you integrate and how do you bundle a very hard commodity that we need, such as cacao or coffee or palm oil or whatever, with a natural asset that is actually building in that brilliant resilience and risk management. Um, and you can do that through a price on carbon. That's what we use um, through Alphalia Climate Funds projects, through Ecosphere Plus and how we work with businesses. But in a lot of cases, that carbon payment is really just a proxy for watershed protection, cloud forest protection, bird, bird corridor migration protection, like what we have in Guatemala, um, biodiversity, which is all things that, that companies are realizing, businesses, governments are realizing are massively valuable. The challenge is, is that, you know, translating that and making that accessible for them is something that we just need a lot more energy behind. That's what Ecosphere Plus tries to do is work with businesses and say, oh, here's your need to have some more resilience in your cacao supply chain. We happen to have these projects over here and we can make this very simple for you through a carbon payment. And I think translating that and making it more accessible is something that's a real challenge and we haven't quite won it. Um, but there is absolutely demand. We just need to connect the dots. And I think that's kind of the, the strength of this panel is we're you know, really trying to connect those dots about bringing the private sector in en masse. And, and in our role, our, our role is really how to bring in um, mainstream businesses and make this stuff just very accessible. So is, are those, just as a quick follow-up view, are those the who that's missing in, 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 this, in the connecting of the dots? 
I think, I think mainstreaming the practice of integrating a payment for environmental service is what is missing. And there are a few pieces that are missing to that puzzle. And part of it is that some companies, when they are trying to use carbon offsets, are just massively criticized. <laughs> There's all sorts of um, criticism of Red Plus and is it perfect and is this great? And, and in the meantime, we're increasing our global greenhouse of gas emissions. We're increasing deforestation. And that, that's a fundamental um, misalignment of values, in my opinion. And so we need to have support from everybody, um, encouraging businesses to have more ambition, giving them more flexibility mechanisms, and you know, having that support will enable, um, enable corporations, especially large-scale corporations, to take more action and to be a little bit more bold in what they're able to do. Um, we have a lot of tools available to us how that links to private, you know, private investment is in that sends the signal to an investor that says, hey, there's some there's somebody willing to buy this. Um, you know, it's fine to go and protect it. And we can say, oh, this is this wonderful. We've protected all this forest. But if somebody isn't willing to say, well, I value it more living than I value it cut down, um, then there's not really going to be a, a business case or, or an investment case for a mainstream investor. So that's why that's that's sort of the, the missing pieces is support and energy and, and dot connecting for businesses. Um, and then also send the businesses sending that price signal and sending that demand signal that will ultimately create um, uh, a return on investment. And that's how you that's how you that's how you get uh, that's how you get a, bring this to scale. Yeah, sure. I, I wonder actually expanding on that last point, Augustine, if, if you if you can hear me. Um, now, you've been involved in creating lots of in, innovative financial structures, and including the first forest bond for debt. Um, now, what is the interplay of financial innovations with all of the stuff that Kate and Marco and Christian have been telling us about? Yeah, I think, you know, as I mentioned Early on, innovation is important, but we have to be careful that we're not innovating for innovation sake. Um, one sort of joke that I, that I have is um, in conservation, it's innovative to do things twice because we're always sort of pushed to do different things and try different things. But you know, historically, we, we have had to, uh, whether it's debt for nature kind of swaps or you know, using philanthropic funds as a way of attracting private capital structures. And that's because of what Kate was saying. Right now, conservation, very bluntly, doesn't pay you know, for, for the most part. Uh, doing things green, the green way, is not necessarily more cost-effective than, than gray. Uh, things are changing, but still there's that gap. So that's where the that innovation comes in, is for either de-risking or somehow um, you know, changing the sort of risk reward. Um, I'll give you an example. So I think innovation is needed and where it's not. So uh, look at a cloud forest sort of example. And then we're working on a project called Blue Energy, which is working with hydropower operators in uh, Colombia, Peru, and, and Bolivia. And so uh, to restore the, the watershed to the cloud forest ecosystem. So restoration means that they get into flow, revenue, and electricity. Uh, and lower sedimentation to lower costs. Now, the, the hydropower operators are fully sort of bought into it, yet they're not willing to make that investment themselves because of the kind of performance risk. So, there you have a case where you have an outcome pay, somebody saying, well, we'll pay you if it works, but we're not willing to take that risk. And there you can use financial innovation to bring other sort of risk bearing capital to take on that upfront cost and then be paid out later on. I think that's a case for innovation that works, but there's an actual need for it. Uh, but a lot of times I see us sort of defaulting to this sort of capital structures where everybody needs to be subordinate or guaranteed or somehow subsidized. Uh, and I think we're doing ourselves a, a disservice if we you know, place conservation and general sort of sustainable land use investments in a separate category uh, than everything else. So when just because it's green, does it really just because it's green doesn't mean you need some sort of special guarantee around your investment. And I think that's a message we sort of conditioned our investors to request that, where we, we need to start pushing the boundaries. Okay. So these are regular investments. You should look at it just the way you're looking at a, a traditional investment. Uh, you you may be investing in places that are risky, but the investment itself is no different than anything else. Uh, 
So I think that's uh, that's where we need to come in as, as, a, as a whole, everybody can sort of make space. Start conditioning people to not automatically default to those sort of uh, mechanisms that, that somehow make conservation riskier. And then really start pushing the boundaries on innovation where it's needed, where things are actually risky and are proof of concept rather than, you know, just something that every investor sort of demands that. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, and pushing people along that pathway. And yeah, changing mindsets on that kind of scale is always going to be a challenge for us. Uh, Christian, have you seen a change in those sorts of mindsets? Are, are people changing? Well, the short answer is that we have seen a change. Otherwise, we, we didn't have uh, you know, 100 million under management uh, from about uh, 14 different live about that but it's that, that i think we have to remind ourselves every day that that, that um and the um the, the the product of a lot of labor uh, to to explain how a business model based around sustainable natural capital uh and conservation could work um one of the things that we've uh, noticed uh in the time that we've been doing this is that the existing suite of financial products available to uh, actors on the ground people who who are practitioners in the land use space, and that's a fancy way of saying you know, farmers and other rural, um, uh, rural, rural inhabitants, and, and also uh, if it's part of it, small and medium sized enterprises that are making a living in the rural economy. The suite of financial products uh, available to them have been inadequate to deliver the type of outcomes that we here you know, on this on this uh, panel are, are aiming for. We want to think that the LF is aiming for. So they, they, they Effectively, the tools that are designed by people who are poor in the town and have traditional um, sort of assessments of risk and harm. And uh, I'm not saying that those tools are appropriate somewhere, but they're probably not um, suitable to deliver uh, uh, sustainable natural capital outcomes. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. If you look at uh, traditional uh, land management practices that we've already at the landscape level, so the rural people and Certainly, indigenous people. This has been a, a pre industrialized uh, European and even many rural economies after the Industrial Revolution very, looked, very much looked at the landscape level because they knew that they, they didn't. Their farming uh, activities would not remain viable if they didn't take care of their water tables, they didn't take care of their pollinators, they could be overhunted the forest, they cut the forest down, they wouldn't have um, a livelihood left. But when sort of the, the, the corporatist sort of neoliberal approach started to take hold everywhere, we started directing finance purely to the farm. And whilst that might work in Kansas for an area of prairie that's already turned into a monoculture, if we want to avoid the Amazon to come like that, we need to be out from the farm a little bit and look for wider scope. So just like I said, the uh, we we observe the speed of financial products available to practitioners is inadequate. We found the mirror image of that and we found that the, the, the ways to invest from a, from, a, from a capital standpoint into outcomes that generate sustainability in that space are also mostly inadequate. So that's why a lot of what I'll feel you uh, say that we've done one thing is to um, generate some innovative, innovative approaches that can deliver, um, deliver uh, results on the ground. And I just came from a, a small landscape talk where I walked um, the, the forum through what we've done at Tampa Park. So I won't repeat that now because it's very difficult to see. But I think it's really important for people to look at what actual successful action on the ground looks like. And also acknowledge, hey, we're not afraid to make mistakes when we're innovating. If we are going to make mistakes, we're going to correct those adapters. We're going to operate with a system of negative feedback loops and we're going to learn and build upon the mistakes and the successes to keep getting it right, not letting the perfect be the enemy of the world. Thank, thank you, Christian. I know there are some people listening online having a little bit of trouble hearing all of what Christian has to say. We, we are going to work to deal with that because it is so interesting. But Marco, I, I wonder actually if you could play devil's advocate to, to what Christian is saying there. I, I, talking about the need for innovation and, and capital and all this stuff that is happening and the, the inappropriateness of financial products for the practitioners on the ground that currently exists. But wouldn't this all happen without finance? Why do we need finance at all? Well, actually, uh, one key point is that we have to move from pilot projects uh, to large-scale projects. And, and, and I think that 
you know, Fundaeco as an NGO has worked with all the major grant uh, givers, uh, but we were all the time doing proof of concept, doing pilots, and we wanted to go from small scale, you know, 300 hectares to large scale. Uh, our Red Plus project currently is seeking to save over 100,000 hectares of very, very threatened forest in Caribbean Guatemala. So I think that we do, do need to move into this large-scale investment that, is, that can be provided by, by private investors. On the other hand, however, uh, I think there's a huge issue, which is that we need to align all the actors and all the institutions. Fundaeco now has 2 million verified carbon units that comply with all the standards by BCS and CCB Gold. But we need to align our projects with uh, the needs of large companies. We need to align our projects with what investors need. And we need to align this also with multi the, the multilateral framework. Right now, I think that the, the, the main issue Fundaeco is facing is this kind of neurotic situation, if I may call it that way, where multilaterals are going in one direction or asking some, some things. Investors are urgently needing uh, good projects. Projects are out there trying to sell their carbon credits, and large companies are often trying to develop their own in-house systems. So we're all kind of trying to do the same thing, but we're not aligned. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, Christian is right. Um, we need better financial products, but be beyond the money, we need to align all the actors because, uh, you know, when Fundaeco sells a carbon credit, we're actually supporting community development. We're actually supporting the protection of very, very endangered amphibians and birds. We're actually even supporting women clinics, clinics that provide sexual and reproductive health and family planning to rural communities. But if we can't sell the credits, then we have a huge issue because we will lose the commitment and we, you, you have to remember that for some of these community forest owners, it took a leap of faith to go into a Red Plus project. You know, they said, okay, we're going to put our community forests in this Red Plus project. It took us months to convince them. And now we have two, 2 million carbon credits that need to be sold. And at the same time, we have the World Bank at the end, the FCPF framework, trying to work with the government. and. As a matter of fact, distorting uh, what projects such as ours need to get rolling in the field. So that yeah, so interesting, and there's some interesting points there about who the emphasis may be on to to change or to mainstream. If the emphasis is on the practitioners, or if the emphasis is on the financial services providers, and and I, and I wonder who we should be placing, I don't know, the, the, the importance for that change on. Is it up to practitioners to show are in the right place for more mainstream investment? Or is it up to investment vehicles and financial service providers and others to adapt themselves for what is currently going on? Kate, I wonder if you can expand a little bit. Yeah, that's funny. I was just thinking I'm probably the least qualified person to answer that question. Um, <laughs> um, I, mean, I think just sort of piggybacking on what Marco has said, the importance of aligning these interests. I mean, historically, I mean, one of the challenges, I think, to, um, to mainstreaming sustainable landscapes is that there's a great deal of education that needs to go into and into creating the, the you know a lot of training a training of farmers aggregating farmers getting them up to speed on on how to use land in a way that is more sustainable i mean all of us need to learn that i learn things in my garden every day and that was historically the role of governments to do that through extension services but you know during the third world debt crisis and all of the austerity measures these were, you know, dramatically stripped back. And so suddenly now the onus is on small local NGOs to try to fill that gap. And then as a result, there's a need for philanthropic capital to come in and fund that. And now we're saying, okay, now we need to move this to the, to the next level and looking at the private sector and how can they fund that? And so that's, you know, that's probably just a misalignment of where funding should be going to. And we need to have governments back into paying for that underlying this is how you this is how you do farming this is how you do conservation 
I mean, when I did my master's thesis on Red Plus in Bolivia in 2008, there were two guys and a broken motorcycle to monitor a 250,000 hectare forest. And this is in Bolivia, which you know had an indigenous leader and you know was allegedly like very pro environment. But you can see there was just no money to pay for doing conservation and doing land use correctly. So I'm always nervous when we talk about innovative finance. Um, I think that got us into some trouble ten years ago. Um, but I think the point is is that we need to sort of look at all of these different pieces, not just looking at how do you drive investment into sustainable land use, but how do you completely change all the investment that's going into unsustainable land use, which is totally dwarfing what's happening on the positive side. So what you need to do is look at, okay, banks on the financial sector side, banks need to stop making loans to all of these you know, projects, which are just like tearing down rainforests. And then also we need to be more coordinated between the multilateral development banks and the NGOs and the ones sort of driving public opinion, you know, really leading corporations and what they should do and really get them into this mindset of you need to do everything possible that you can. Um, you know, you, can, you should be buying carbon credits, you should be internalizing a price on carbon and that sends sort of the demand signal. And in the meantime, sort of understanding who should be paying for what pieces of this value chain. You know, the education piece should probably be public sector, but looking at, you know, innovations and in technology, you know, that's that's sort of more the, the realm of the private sector or you know, public private partnerships. So I hope that was helpful. Yeah, and I knew you the right person. <laughs> I um, did my best. You did a very, very good job. Uh, Augustine, I who in this kind of almost we're almost there, it feels like, but is there a role in your experiences of government to jump into no we lost you we lost our moderator yes apparently so government augustine what's the role of governments <laughs> we are in washington so Hello, can you hear me? You're back. Okay, yeah. good. So, uh, all of this money that's going into unsustainable uh, land uses and kind of those sorts of things that should be redirected into more sustainable processes, are governments playing an active role in, in, in doing that or should they be more and what is the role of the kind of regulatory framework and things like that in that or is this just up to the market? Is this the market has to decide this? Well, and hopefully you can hear me uh, a bit better. I'm going to try and get closer. So obviously government has a huge role to play and, and regulation has a huge role to play both in incentivizing good behavior and, and you know, penalizing for bad behavior and good behavior that is negative uh, for society. So that that's uh, totally you know undisputed. I think what we try to say sometimes is that the system is, is broken, and referring to the system, people you know cutting down rainforests to plant palm oil. Uh, the system is working perfectly fine, right? The system is working exactly as it should, given the rules that are in place. So people are maximizing their profits. People are you know, even sort of playing by the rules uh, and, and, and doing what they should. Not all the time, but um, obviously a lot of the time. So it, that's an outcome that we obviously don't don't want to see. So there needs to be a big push to change regulation, to make it more attractive, to, to have the incentives uh, in the right place. But I think one, one place we've sort of failed on as, as uh, a community is making conservation in, in all of its forms a source of jobs, a source of economic growth, source of revenue for the government. Uh, if, if conservation were to become that, uh, then governments would jump on board in a second. Right? So I think we've always sort of presented conservation or, or sustainable development as, uh, as almost a less attractive option to the business as usual. And that's absolutely not the case. Uh, so we need to work with governments to have the policies in place. We need to have the right regime. Uh, in place, but we also need to have the investors to go alongside us and to prove that these projects, these investments are actually positive for the country and not just for investors, uh, whether they're sitting in Europe or the US. So these are positive investments for these countries, for these communities, which are leading to positive outcomes uh, that the government wants to see. 
So I think as long as we start framing it like that, and, and once we have a bigger sample size of, of those types of projects, the type of work that Ophelia is doing, a bunch of uh, you know different funds and NGOs are doing all over the world, we need to get that message out and to really change like, the narrative. Uh, and, and that's when you're going to see real, real change. And Christian, maybe to you for a slightly a bit more of a technical question. I think linked as well. That what is the role that safeguards and ESG and things like that are playing in in this space in in the in the kind of ideas of investors, ideas of risk and things like that, as it relates to this, these sorts of investments in conservation. Um. Yeah, sure. That's that's a good question, and, and it's a little bit related because uh, I guess one of the, um, the points I'd like to sort of uh, um, just kind of pick up on that Augustine just made, and uh, I guess Kate also. Uh, well, we, we've all made it in the market, but you know, in, investments in natural capital can be a, uh, a, a country manager's best friend, a government's best friend, because they can deliver. Rightly done, they can deliver so many additional development outcomes that are so crucial. To human prosperity, and in, in the global south, where development is is very much you know needed at a relatively quick pace for a number of reasons, natural capital investments, while maybe they don't generate the income, the outcomes that the, um, electoral sort of cycles demand within two or three years, certainly over the five to ten years space can be absolutely transformational and can transform livelihoods without negative transformation for our global environment, uh, or local environment rather, which is also itself so dependent or help um, uh, required to achieve those lasting outcomes. So your, your, your question was about ESG and risk management and impact. But it's very important that when we are investing in new ways, when we are um, um, innovating, I, I, I agree with Kate, it can be a daunting road for a number of reasons, uh, but, it be, but it, 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 it can be. Um, we need to make sure that um, those um, uh, the rollouts of those types of um, approaches are very inclusive uh, and collaborative, consultative, etc. So, um, you know, things like free fire and informed consent, um, it's not just a label that you stick on something or a box you tick. It is absolutely imperative to preserving, well, obtaining and preserving licensed operators. And, and also the ability to replicate. Because if you get something wrong once and got to be twice, it's probably not going to be a third time, um, and uh, and it's, it, we, we can't afford to take shortcuts when we're talking about people's lives and livelihoods. Um, equally, when we're dealing in sensitive ecological areas, um, you know, if we're if we're you know committed to achieving climate outcomes, but we're not looking at the biodiversity risks, then we're also uh, cutting off our nose to spite our face and probably creating much bigger problems that might be insoluble down the road. So, um, at least speaking for Ophelia. Um, it, that is absolutely at the centerpiece of our uh, uh, USP and what we do. And without uh, exemplary ESG, that is, um, is uh, you know, also going through the transparency, we feel like we, we don't have a business model. So we, it's, it's what we do every morning. It's the first thing we think about, the last thing we think about. And the last thing I'll say about that is that it also is the foundation of our, um, of our impact monitoring and reporting and, and delivery uh, model. Um, that, 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 Sound um, approach to environmental management, environmental social management, enables us to then build a set of, uh, of KPIs with key, uh, uh, key indicators uh, and also project uh, level indicators that um, are unique to certain projects to build those out and then show investors as well as other stakeholders, important ones like governments and NGOs and society, what is the precise relationship between uh, the investment and outcome. It's all fine and good if you put a bunch of money in and you know, yeah, some good things happen. It, it, it's fine and you know, some, 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 some people smile and some, some habitat is saved. But we need to be much more professional than that. The transformation that arises from that investment. Because that's that's what's going to enable us to keep doing it. If we get it right and we can prove it and we have the science behind it, we can keep doing it and we create a bigger pool of capital. Um, from which to, to draw from, and we also create a larger set of on the ground uh, actors, um, you know, more from Dico, so to speak, who are willing to work utilizing this approach and bring a good track record to the sector. And that's what helps professionalize it and, and, and also demonstrate that applying that sustainability lens and that reality lens, like I called it earlier, 
uh, to uh, investments in the wider agricultural or central space, etc., um, is not as scary as it might appear um, in, 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 at first blush. So, uh, slightly back to you, Christian, actually. Oh. I, I just have a quick follow up on this that. So your 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 USP for Thelia is very heavily, um, kind of integrated with these kind of yeah this very environmentally and socially responsible set of KPIs that you follow. How how proprietary are you over those as a company, or is your attitude that you want this mainstream? You want everybody using the Athelia model, um, and and almost to you would be happy if your USP wasn't just your USP anymore, that it was everybody's USP. No, I mean, we're, we're very transparent about it. Um, first of all, the, uh, the ESG uh, policy and uh, environmental social management systems that we employ at the project level are based around the IFC performance standards, as well as a, num a number of other uh, sector-specific standards like the, uh, the climate community and biodiversity standards. Uh, and others appropriate to a given sector that we're operating in, you know, or organic certification and so forth. So we, we build around those, but we then go uh, steps further. And again, this is published uh, clearly uh, not only in our, um, on our website, but we publish it in our annual impact report. We want people to know what we're doing and we want it to be seen as, as transparent and, and, get, and delivering traceability. So we're not, I, I don't think we're, we're, we're speaking to them the slightest bit. When I refer to our USP, I think it's that, I mean, it's, you know, look, we're not Apple. We, we, we don't have a technological advantage that we keep locked away in a vault. I think it's just that, you know, we, 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 we've taken a risk that we can align economic and financial uh, objectives in the one hand, with social and environmental, so climate, so biodiversity objectives on the other. And we, we do feel as though we add a lot of value in terms of the manner in which we Select investments and deploy capital on the ground, and work with partners like Ecosystem Plus to generate the most value from from, from those assets uh, in, in, in marketplaces, and certainly in the way that we deal with uh, partners like like Marco. Um, but at the end of the day, what we want we want replication. So, um, uh, no, the, the KPIs, the project uh, monitoring indicators. Uh, and everything that we use, uh, as well, and, and the numbers behind them are published. Uh, and, and we, we welcome <laughs> others to to get involved. Replication. We want this replicated and scaled. Not only do we want it replicated, I can assure you that our investors um, want it replicated as well. And, and even investors who maybe didn't get involved in our first fund, but are looking at some of the new products that we have on the horizon, like the Sustainable Ocean Fund or the Land Degradation Neutrality Fund. They're really interested in pipeline. They want to see that Althelia has access um, either through its existing portfolio, as we're again, with Marco, uh, to find other opportunities to work together in the local areas in which they operate, but uh, in other regions as well. So um, they're, they, they, they demand replication. Uh, you know, it's no, no, inter no one's interest for us to be a one trick pony. Marco, maybe. I mean, you've been referenced a few times in there as, as the real example of what Christian is talking about. And, and could, you, could you give us some of your perspectives of, of being that space where collaborative and consultative and replicable practices are happening? Um, you are that, and, and, and how, how can we all collaborate and replicate what you are doing? Well, I think that... Uh... Very briefly, I think the, the first thing I would say at the government level is alignment. One of the things that we have learned is that uh, maybe the Minister of Agriculture has one position, the Forestry Institute has one position, the Protected Areas Institution has one position, the Ministry of Economics has one position, and sometimes they, they can be contradictory. So in order to replicate, we have to ensure alignment among the institutions that are going to partner in supporting a large landscape level project. So that, that would be one lesson learned that's very important. The second is project design. Uh, although we all believe strongly in, in, in carbon pricing and, and in, in, in the sale of the future and sale of carbon credits, projects have to be a little creative in, in deploying uh, diversified revenue streams. One of the things we learn is that we cannot only count in carbon, particularly in the early years of the project, 
and we had to develop uh, multiple revenue streams in order to make the project financially viable, including ecotourism, agroforestry commodities, water, uh, but projects have to be creative. And I think that's a second replicable lesson learned, which is that uh, we cannot count in only one revenue stream if, if we want to hit you know, attractive ROIs for our projects. The, the third thing is absorption capacity. Uh, Fundaeco took more than two years in developing its project, and I think that if we had had some kind of support in project acceleration, in project design and development, probably it could have taken six months. And I think that one of the lessons learned is also that uh, there are many good ideas out there, but going from one idea, a good idea into a solid bankable project, we need uh, capacity development, we need, need training, we need stronger financial uh, preparation. So, so I think that the third lesson le learned is that we would need project accelerators. You know, now we have done the hard road, but if we had project accelerators, we could go faster in developing absorption capacity. Uh, so, so I think those are the main lessons. And, and the fourth would be, of course, strong stakeholder participation. Uh, we had a free prior and informed consent process that involved more than 3,000 uh, community members. Uh, more than 150 uh, uh, consent procedure activities and communication and outreach activities. So this is, of course, very, very important in order to have stakeho stakeholder endorsement for the project. However, we have all these people now involved, heavily engaged, and of course, very faithful that this is, this is going to work. And this is where we have to move forward now. We have to make Red Plus markets work. We have to make carbon pricing improved because, because at current prices, we will not be reaching adequate uh, implementation costs. We will not be really transferring direct benefits to, to communities if prices stay as long as they are. So I think those are some of the lessons learned that, uh, from our project. And, and that's fascinating. Kate, could you, could you hear us? Sorry, I yes. can't see you on the screen. Okay, good, lovely, yeah. you're there. Um, uh, just as we get to wrapping up, we're going to try and finish this around two o'clock for, for the, those of you listening. So um, as we start to think about wrapping up, Marco's very clear, specific examples of car carbon credits alone aren't going to work. And we need to be creative. We need to work on absorption capacity and we need to make the markets work. This suggests that carbon credits alone can't capitalize private investment, or can they? I, I will never be one to say that there is a silver bullet solution to anything. Um, so certainly relying on carbon credits alone is not going to solve the carbon, uh, the climate crisis and, you know, establish you know, sustainable regenerative landscapes globally. But they're a really incredible tool that we can use to help finance a a a transition. Um, you know, we've heard all about the energy transition and the energy revolution that we need, and we need a land use revolution, and we all know it. Um, and carbon finance can be such an incredible and valuable tool. Um, it does three really important things. One, it provides revenue to the projects, not the only revenue. And Marco is, you know, his pro his, he's very brilliant and knows that you can't just sort of say one thing. No economy would do that and say, we're going to just focus on one thing and do that one thing only. Um, but it does provide really, really important revenue um, into the projects. It creates a flexibility mechanism for businesses um, that are going to um, uh, want to do more. They want to do everything they can. They have what we have five years left or something in order to secure a less than two degrees pathway. So we need to be giving businesses flexibility mechanisms, not choking them down and saying, you need to completely manage and get your whole supply chain perfect. So it does that. And also it helps deliver ROI, which is really important to funds like Althelia um, and looking to say, how do I scale this? How do I go to fund two? How do I go to fund three? And you do that by, um, by delivering that return. And so it's a really important tool. It's one that's massively underutilized and I think massively undervalued. Um, and, it's, and it's a pity, um, but it's certainly not everything, but it's a really important piece of the pie. So thank you, Kate. And 
Okay, so I have two almost wrap-up questions. Uh, uh, I guess then I'm going to start with you. Um, is there a lack of investable projects in the pipeline? Is there a lack of an investable pipeline? Is that what's stopping this gro uh, the growth in, in this market? Um, and what, if so, what can we do about it? What's the next steps moving forward? Yeah, that, that pipeline issue is something that's talked about a lot. And, and I think uh, Marco, in, in, in his um, comment, mentioned that that they, at some point in the revolution, they needed some help, right? some acceleration. Um, and I, I think we see a lot of that. Um, but there's um, the sort of two sides to it, the pipeline issue. And I agree there's not enough pipeline. If I had $100 billion to invest in natural capital projects, you couldn't place it all. You know, uh, in, at least in the types of projects that, that, that we see. Um, but I think it, it's a mix. So there, there, are, uh, there is a lack of pipeline uh, of investable projects, but there's also a misalignment in capital, right? A lot of the people that are saying there's a lack of, of, of projects are the ones that are expecting 30% returns with no risk. Um, so, yeah, you know, if you have that kind of capital, uh, you're not going to find many projects right now in our space. But I think there also is, is a sort of gap between the projects that have been developed over time with philanthropic capital and, and commercial debt or commercial investment on the other side. There's a big gap between the two, uh, which you know, is, is kind of referred to as a value of death, uh, like in most of other sectors. So I think what we need to do is somehow accelerate these projects or bridge those projects that are, that are working, or have business models but they need a little bit of more support before they can accept commercial investment. And, and that's something we're focusing on quite a bit at CI. We launched a new fund called CI Ventures, which is a sort of an impact first vehicle. And we want to partner with, with the likes of Alpelia and a number of different funds out there to figure out how can we develop a more investable pipeline of projects. So if, if, if really that's the issue, then let's put some money, uh, let's put some investment at play, let's put some at-risk capital uh, into developing some of these projects. And, and resolve that issue. You know, this is not sort of rocket science, right? It, it, it is an, a solvable problem, but we need the right type of capital uh, at play. We need people to take risks, not outrageous risks, but, but to bear some risk. And uh, and we need to start you know, developing a business model that can accept uh, those, those kinds of returns. So for, for me, at the end of the day, it's not whether Marco and, and you know, those types of great projects can get investment from our media where they can get investment from Citibank Guatemala. Right? Like that's, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's when you're changing the, the market, is, is when these businesses are just investable, and they can just go to the right thing to do if you're um, you know, a credit analyst for one of these banks. So that's where we're going to. I'm very positive that we'll, we'll, we'll get there, uh, but there needs to be more investment in that sort of acceleration of the development um, that you know, needs to happen. Uh, after we... Excellent. Uh and I, I'm finding it interesting that you all have obviously been very well trained to speak in threes, which is all very digestible and very <laughs> nice. Because uh, as I took three takeaways from that, Augustine, that yeah, the right capital, people to take risks, and the right business models. And I think that's a, a, a very nice kind of summary of some of the challenges we have to get, get over. Christian, I wonder if you can can give us some pathways for how we overcome some of the last existing barriers for really growing. Uh, impact finance in the natural capital space. What are, what are some of the quick takeaways, quick things that we can do? Okay, yeah, uh, very quickly, and I'll, and I'll try to come up with three to keep the nice um, uh, serendipitous pattern going. Um, well, I'm afraid that um, I'm going to probably focus my, my guns here on policymakers, governments, and multilaterals a little bit now, because um, the fact of the matter is for um, the better part of 10 years, um, yeah, certainly 10 years, um, I've heard uh, policymakers and, and uh, very senior people from multilateral organizations talk about engaging the private sector. And you know, now the, the, the catchphrase we all use is very good with blended finance and so forth. And we, we've got a model, certainly the blended finance model is something that we can all understand on paper, uh, whereby um, the definition of limited forces of, of, of donor capital are, are deployed to leverage additional uh, private money into the space. Um, 
in certainly the natural capital arena, um, in my view, I think that um, that uh, the, the, the achievements um, by policymakers in this case have been pretty modest. Uh, there have been a couple of nice things, uh, and, we're, and we're grateful. I mean, we've done a couple of uh, development credit authority guarantees with USAID over the years, which is great. They give some portfolio uh, risk management, some, some downside protection, and that's great. They use an existing off-the-shelf product with DCA to make it work for our model, and we're very grateful for that. It's, it's wonderful. Our investors appreciated it. I think the projects appreciated it, and so forth. But um, you know, and we have a couple of DFIs who are investors into the fund, and who are probably going to be investing in, in the, the next two funds we launch this year. But um, aside from you know those important uh, uh, developments, um, there's a, a lot of a lot of heat and not very much light. So now is the time for. A lot of the billions of dollars that have been pledged by three or four governments that everybody knows through a couple of multilateral agencies that everybody knows to start seriously about how to um, create this set of incentives that's going to really lead to behavioral transformation uh, in, in, in the private sector financing, of course, yes, uh, and, and enable a greater reach for that financing, enable more Alphelios to get involved. But also um, just practitioners of small to medium-sized enterprises operating in the in the Cerrado or in, in you know Tanzania or what have you, who are just basically building you know, have a profit or want to have a profitable business, but also want to you know bring sustainability into their core operating procedures. Those types of uh, policy instruments, and I'm thinking to be specific here of, of things modeled after the uh, feed-in tariffs that we had have seen used to so much effect in the renewable energy space. Uh, reverse auctioning uh, facilities, which you know, the World Bank has used with methane uh, and, and has been quite successful. There are various uh, uh, um, approaches that um, policy level um, uh, developments. And once the enabling policy is in place, then lo and behold, Private actors want to follow the law and they want to maximize a uh, uh, benefit for their business and also put, uh, uh, improve license to operate. They start acting in a way that the, the policy uh, directive sort of would like them to do. I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet in just a second, but I'm going to give you really one concrete example. And I can't give you the year this happened, but um, I was speaking to an American friend recently and I was telling them about how in, in the EU, um, the retailer and the producer of white goods, meaning washers, dryers, dishwashers, refrigerators, has the obligation to ensure that that unit at the end of its life is, um, is, is disposed of um, uh, correctly. And, and what can be recycled is recycled, and what can be it must be disposed is disposed of in an environmentally sensitive manner. Um, that's a policy level at the EU level. And, and you know, John Lewis and Marks and Spencer's somebody who's selling me a washing machine has to build that into. The operating model, the business model, and and then you and I, uh, when we're done with it, we, we know where to go. We don't just dump it out in a, in a field somewhere. Well, that didn't come about because of of sort of ethical, ethically minded, um, you know, uh, CEOs who said enough's enough. We're not going to have any more refrigerators chucked in a ditch somewhere. They did it because of, of, of government directive, and it's effective. I'm not saying that every single piece gets recycled. A hell of a lot more effective than having nothing. My American friend was like, oh, well, that would never work in the, in the U.S. Well, I don't believe that because there was a day, probably not too long ago, when you know, a, a, a Frenchman or a Brit said, oh, that would never work in France or in the U.K. It will work when the political will um, is developed and deployed. And I think we need to see that same kind of imagination and, and, and courage um, used in, in our space. And we need to do it very quickly uh, if, if, if we want to stay anywhere near two degrees. We get one and a half, uh, but anywhere near two degrees, um, and frankly, maybe even three, we need to act very quickly at the society level. Absolutely, so Christian. Uh, that, that, that it was a big one. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, Christian. And uh, yes, let's, uh, I mean, I think that's a very correct uh, call on our governments and policymakers to really jump into this space in the right way. Uh, Kate, I'm going to give you. A minute and a half to give us some key things you think that we all need to be doing next. How do we mainstream this? What does us as consumers need to be seeing next? Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like I've already had my final three, but I can try to come up with another three. Um, 
Uh, just sort of building on what Christian was saying, I think it's really important that businesses and governments stop undermining people. People want to do something. They don't want to have to think about what it is. So in some ways, just saying, here, pay three cents for your plastic bag. We're not going to let you use a plastic straw anymore. You can take, you can do this to people. People want it. They care about nature. They care about climate. They don't necessarily want to be regulated within an inch of their lives. I totally get that. But this idea that you can't ask people to pay for something is ludicrous. And they do it all the time all over the world. So I think that's the first thing is people, governments and businesses need to stop being so afraid of their customers and their constituents. Um, you can tell them what to do and they will do it it's, as long as it's sensible. You know, if it's not sensible, then, you know, but you say, look, we're going to, you know, so on. So I think that's one thing. Um, on the other side, I really think that we need to, um, we need to go easier um, in some respects on businesses. And I'm going to, I've said this already like three times, but we need to really give them permission to be their best selves um, rather than just beating them down for every bad thing they do. We are complicit in all of this. If you look at an oil company's carbon footprint, 90% of it is use phase. 90% of it is us burning it. So we need to sort of get out of this like idea that we're going to tear everybody down because they're not perfect. So maybe that's cultural transformation, but I think that starts with us where we can say, here's an opportunity for somebody to do something. We're gonna give them the best advice about how to do it. We've certainly set up, Ophelia Climate Fund has set up some projects that are you know, held to the highest performance standards in the financial sector, totally rigorous. We are creating a, a new asset class of carbon credits that's really legitimate. You know, that's something that they can do. And so, and rather than sort of tearing people down for trying to do all they can do, we need to actually start saying, okay, it's all hands on deck. I mean, as Christian said, we, we'll be lucky if we get to a three, degree, three degrees at this rate. So that's another thing that I think needs a lot of coordination sort of in our community. Um, I know CI has been great about really encouraging businesses to you know, buy red credits and they have this amazing project in Peru as well. And so, um, but there are others that are, are a bar you know, it's a barrier for, for businesses and in large corporations. Um, so I'm just going to let it be two. I think Very that's good. enough. Fine. Yeah. And how about we count down? Marco, as the practitioner, as the person who's doing this stuff on the ground, can you give us one, your one takeaway that you want everyone listening to be going away <laughs> with as they leave? Actually, I'm going to say three, too. And I'm going to say three dreams. Yes. Three dreams, or four dreams. My first dream is that we develop a blockchain, block, uh, we leverage blockchain technology uh, in order to have consumers pay the carbon pricing of each final article they, they buy. And that would help us leverage a lot of money and maybe we could sell carbon credit for 30 or $40 that way. You know, that's a first dream. A second dream would be to have FCPF create two windows. One window that would directly buy credit from projects right away. And a second window that can spend another three or four or 10 years working with governments to align everything uh, under the ERPDs for each country, because if not, we're not going to get the machine rolling uh, in, in, this, in this system. My third dream is local carbon markets. We have also to work with cement factories, we have to work with oil palm companies, we have to work with, with uh, local ships and truck, for, uh, truck companies, uh, because uh, our countries also have a responsibility. So I would dream that local carbon markets are also developed and also value local projects such as ours. And finally, my dream would be that we align better the financial components in, in, a, in a virtue circle. Grants and, and multilateral financing should go to, in the early stages, to develop uh, proof of concept. Then we would have uh, investment funds such as Alphelia come in in the early stages of an investment where it's high risk, high yield, and then we could move to local banks and local funding through traditional banking. If we can, you know, create this virtuous circle in which grants develop proof for concept and, and project acceleration, investment funds come in in the early high risk stages, and then local banks keep on funding processes for, you know, sustainable landscapes, then we can really think about replicating and going up in scale. Superb. And Thank you very much, Marco, for that very lovely bow you put on the discussion. And I would like to thank all of our presenters, Christian, Augustine, Kate, and Marco, for 
say, I'd like to thank everybody who's listening online. As ever, this GLF Digital Summit will be available as a podcast very, very soon. And we will reach out to everybody who registered to send you the link so you can re-listen to all of the great insights that were put forward today. And this is obviously a very important thing and it fits wonderfully into the Global Landscapes Forum world. My big takeaway that I took from this was actually the word alignment. I think if we were word clouding this conversation, the word alignment probably came up the most. And it's my big takeaway from this, that there are spaces where we can align different stakeholders and different people. And we hope spaces like the GLF are good platforms for doing that as part of our mission. And it, I think it, it links very nicely with this conversation. So we need to get aligned on all of this to really scale and move forward. Um, this Global Landscapes Forum Digital Summit was um, supported by our funders, the German government, BMUP and BMZ. Um, this event, the investment case, was supported by the World Bank Group uh, and the GEF. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you very much again, presenters, for participating. And we hope to see all of you again very, very soon. Thank you. Right. Thank you, David. Bye. Bye-bye.